what would it be? And a lion's share of them said Romans. And the reason for that is Romans is heavy with doctrine. Doctrine is just a biblical word for truth. We see the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of God's sovereignty, and the doctrine of uh, the heart to serve God. And it's all in the book of Romans. And the first 11 chapters, he teaches us, like all of Paul's letters are like this. We know the Holy Spirit used Paul's hand. That the first half is, how, what do we believe? And then the second half is, then now knowing what we believe, how do we behave? So what do we believe? How do we behave? We see that in all the letters that Paul writes. That's what Romans is. It's an epistle, which just means a letter. Um, this is the only letter. It's unique in that Paul had never been to Rome at this point. He will get there at some point. But when he writes this letter, he's not been there yet. Every other letter he's writing to a church he planted, and he's giving them instruction. So this is more of a general letter written to people living in a very godless and idolatrous and wealthy city. Does that sound like any place you might have heard of? And we live in that here. By the way, pray for Calabasas. You guys, if you don't know, there's only two churches in this whole city. And we're the larger one. I should tell you something. And the reality is that this city is heavily Jewish. And praise God, we love the Jewish people. And it's, it's very wealthy and thinks it doesn't need the Lord. And that's why we're here. Amen? And we do reach people from all over. People come from the radio program and stuff. But pray for this city. So as we come to Romans, he's talked about behavior. The first half he talked about of Romans chapter 1. He kind of gave, you know, his background and an introduction. And then last week we saw, I titled the message, Provoking the Wrath of God. Talking about how God reaches out to man and how man's men respond largely in rebellion against God. So now we come to chapter 2. And as we come to chapter 2, I want to talk, I titled the message, if you have your outline, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? You know, two weeks ago, we celebrated the resurrection of our Savior. And we should celebrate that every week. Can we say amen to that? And he's a risen and living savior. But as a, I've been a pastor for 30 years, and a question I get often, I remember when the Passion movie came out, I was pastoring in Santa Cruz at the time, and I'd be at the Little League field, and people knew I was a pastor. I'd be in the grocery store, and people would come up to me after seeing the Passion and say, why did Jesus have to go through that? Why did that have to happen? I don't understand. He's perfect, holy God. Why did he have to be tortured like that? And often we wonder, why did Jesus have to die? And again, while we do recognize a, a Resurrection Sunday, we wonder sometimes, why did an innocent man have to die? People even say, why don't they call it Bad Friday? It's not Good Friday, but it's Great Friday. Amen? Why didn't Jesus stop Judas from betraying him? Why did he let them arrest him? Why did he submit to an illegal trial in the middle of the night? Why didn't he even try to defend himself? Why did he endure the excruciating pain of torture and being scourged? Why did a murderer go free and our Savior die in his place? Why did he have to go to the cross? That's what Romans 2 is going to answer. Romans 2 is going to answer that the reason Jesus endured it all, first and foremost, is because he loves you. And secondly, because you and I have a sin problem. Can we say amen to that? How many sinners we got in the room? If your hands are up, you're lying and you're sinning again. Amen? So we're all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And the reason Jesus had to die is because we are sinners, because we've been separated from God, and because we are depraved, we are lost. And Jesus went to the cross and suffered and died in our place and took our sin upon himself that you and I might be forgiven and have eternal life. Amen? Now, chapter 2, he's going to turn the focus largely to the religious leaders that are going to be reading this letter. And he's going to be addressing them because often there are those of us who think that somehow we don't need what others do. That we're better than somebody else. That somehow our religion has caused us not to need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're going to see in this morning's text, nothing could be further from the truth. Again, the word of God is so clear, and we so desperately need to be forgiven. So if you have your outline, grab it. Let's go through this quickly, and we'll dig into the text. Why did Jesus have to die? Number one, we're all guilty. Everyone in this room, we're all guilty. If we stood before the judge, and they played out our life in front of him, all the sins we've committed, all the thoughts we've had, all the things that we've done, we would be guilty. And we're going to see what causes us to be guilty. How do we know that we're guilty? First of all, in light of the truth. 
Too often people have a standard for what they think the truth is or a standard for what it means to be good. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen? By the way, this is not going to be a secret, sensitive, feel-good message this morning. I'm not going to be blowing sunshine on you. I'm going to be telling you the truth. Amen? And again, it's a good news. It's always good news. But here's the reality is that the standard is not other people. Because when you'll talk to people, most people will say, if they're, especially if they don't know the Lord, do you think of yourself as a good person? I've never had anyone. I talk to people on death row. Yeah, I'm a good person. I do prison ministry. I'm a good person. Because everyone compares themselves to someone worse than themselves. Amen? Well, I'm no Osama bin Laden. I'm no Adolf Hitler. I'm no Charles Manson. Wow, setting the bar high. And the reality is, I say this off, most of you guys know I have a full-time job long being a pastor, is God doesn't grade on a curve, he grades at the cross. He doesn't compare us to other men, the standard is Jesus Christ. We all look pretty good if we find the worst person we can find to say, well, I'm, I'm not as bad as that person, but guys, how, when we make Jesus the standard, how are we doing? Amen. We're sinners in desperate need of a savior. Amen. But praise God for his love and his grace and his mercy. So first of all, in light of the truth, we're guilty. In light of our actions. Who sinned this week? Amen. If, if we took in my life or any one of your lives, and what if we could get a videotape of everything you thought this week and everything you did and everything you said, and we could just play it on the screen for the next hour. Who wants to volunteer for that program? I think we'd all run out of the building if our name got drawn. So in light of the truth of who Jesus is and we are in comparison, in light of our actions, we're all guilty. And in light of God's impartial judgment, there's no partiality with God. God loves all of humanity. Amen? He desires that none should perish, no, not one. And we're going to see that this morning. Not only that, we're all, not only are we all guilty, but your godly heritage can't save you. A lot of times as a pastor, when I meet people, and maybe even just as a Christian, people, when they, especially when they find your pastor, people will love to tell me immediately all their family members that have been in ministry, which is great. My great grandfather was a, was a, you know, a minister, you know, a missionary to India for 40 years. Praise God. Hey, my, my uncle was in ministry. My aunt did this. My cousin did this. I'm like, that's great. What about you? Where are you at with the Lord? Guys, God has no grandchildren. Amen? You're not saved because your parents are saved. Every one of us must have our own relationship with Almighty God. We'll see that in this morning's text. And then finally, outward religion and rituals won't save you. Please don't take this wrong. You can have your holy, first holy communion. You can have your, uh, you can go to catechism. You can go to Sunday school. You can be baptized. You can take communion and you can go to hell. Amen? Because guys, if we're just doing the ritual, but we don't have the relationship with the Lord, we're not saved. My question when I was a youth pastor was always to the kids, is Jesus Christ your best friend? Are you married to the Lord? Are you a part of the bride of Christ? Are you putting your faith in your good works or his great grace? Do you fully grasp what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ? And so as this letter is written, as we begin here, we're going to see he's focusing largely on those with the black robes who are religious and lost. Can you be religious and lost? What's the answer? You can think, you can be a very religious person. You can put your faith in walking an aisle and praying a prayer when you were nine years old, but your life never changed. You can put your faith in a lot of other things. But the reality is that Christianity will be seen not just in what we believe, but also will be reflected in how we behave because we are new creations in Christ. Amen? So let's begin there in verse 1 of Romans chapter 2, looking at the fact that why did Jesus have to die? And so he had just told them, in the second half of Romans chapter 1, that was some heavy stuff last week. Can we say amen to that? Talked about all those, you know, homosexuality, fornication, gossip, and went down the list. And these are the things you're guilty of. And then he says in verse 1, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. 
Therefore, no break in Paul's writing. Paul turns from speaking about the Gentile pagan world to speaking directly to the religious leaders of the day who no doubt were listening to this list and thinking, well, that's not me. I'm not a homosexual. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a gossip. I'm not a liar. I'm not like those people. And you know what? That is one of the biggest turnoffs to Christianity is the self-righteous hypocrite. Can we say amen to that? Where people... You know, I I used to answer the phone at Calvary San Jose when I was a youth pastor and Don McClure was the pastor there. And Sunday mornings, different pastors would answer the phone because people would always call to find out about the service. And one Sunday I picked up the phone and the guy goes, hypocrite. I answered the phone. I didn't even know who I am. Hello, hypocrite. I said, sometimes. (laughs) Amen. Not proud of that. Remember, a hypocrite is, is a mask wearer. Someone who pretends to be something, but their life doesn't always reflect it. Amen? Hypocrite, right? And so the reality is he's looking at these guys who are with their black robes and have listened to the first part of this letter, read it, and then think, oh, well, that's not me. I'm not like those vile people. I wear the black robe, and I'm a religious leader, and I've got a title by my name, and people praise me in the streets, and I sit in the front of the synagogue and certainly could be talking about me. Yeah, those poor sinful people out there. And sometimes we fall into the trap of when we read a chapter, we love to apply it to someone else. Amen? People walk out of church, my husband needed to hear that message. You got a CD? I got a friend at work that needs to hear this. And the reality is I pray we're coming here not so we can, you know, point someone else to it, but we examine our own lives. Amen? And he's saying to the crowd, you guys are inexcusable. You're without excuse. Tells the self-righteous religious that while they may feel like they're better than the pagan sinners, they're without excuse. They are just as guilty. The word judge there, where he says, whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. It's krino, to judge to condemnation, to sneer on one's face, to self-righteously point at another in anger. See, people will read verses like this and say, we can never judge sin as being sin. It's the only verse the atheist knows. Judge not lest you be judged. Every time I talk to one, don't be judging me. Your Bible says judge not. But that's not what it's talking about. We can say that sin is sin. Can we say amen to that? It's sin. It's wrong. In my life, in your life, out in the world, it's sin. It's wrong. We can judge that. But what he's saying is, in this case, they're judging another from a self-righteous attitude, sneering at them, pointing at them, mocking them. And he's saying to this group of self-righteous people, you're sneering at people and you're pointing at them and you're being angry and you're being self-righteous and you're guilty of the same. This sounds a lot like Jesus talking to the religious leaders. Amen? The only time we see Jesus getting angry in the Bible is with the religious hypocrites who were self-righteous, who thought they were greater who thought they had arrived, he called them whited sepulchers, a brood of vipers. Guys, when we self-righteously point out the sins of another, portraying ourselves to be holy, often we are just as guilty. Our sin may not be as obvious as to the outward man, but man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. You know, I've never murdered anybody. The Bible says if you've ever had hatred in your heart, Jesus said this, you've committed murder. So with that being the case for murder, who in the room are murderers? I hate that guy. Ever said that once? Ever thought it? Amen? Well, adulterers and fornicators, I've never done that. I've been faithful to my wife who married 33 years. The Bible says if you've ever lusted in your heart, you're an adulterer. See, man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart. And we can fool man by looking very righteous and religious, but God knows the truth. Amen? Here's the best part about that. He knows you best and he loves you most. Amen? He knows every wicked, vile thing you've ever thought, said, or done. He knows the things in your heart that no one else would know that you'd be ashamed of. And he still loves you because he's a God of love and grace and mercy. Amen? But as he's writing this letter to this early church, this is the doctrine of sin. And he's pointing out to them that in Rome, just because you're religious doesn't mean you're right with God. To self-righteously judge others when we ourselves are sinners. So what makes us guilty? Look at verse 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. So the standard is not the opinions of men. The standard is not how we compare to others. The standard is the truth. Who's the truth? 
Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So the standard isn't the culture. The standard isn't what's legal and illegal. I've had people say to me, well, Pastor Dave, now that marijuana is legal, I can smoke dope, right? Uh, adultery is legal. Should you be committing adultery? Fornication's legal. Should you be committing, you know what I mean? No, the, the laws of the land do not determine what is right in the eyes of God. Amen. Can we say amen to that? And so he says they're inexcusable because they've got the wrong standard. Guys, the standard isn't, well, we live in the year 2018, and, you know, I know I'm a Christian, but, you know, th those rules from 2,000 years ago are archaic, and what's the big deal if I'm sleeping with my girlfriend? What's the big deal if I'm, you know, lying on my taxes a little bit? They spend it on the wrong stuff anyway. What's wrong with that? And we, we can have our own creative way of creating, you know, this moral relativism based on what the culture does and what we think is right instead of what the Word of God says. Guys, the word of God is always the final court of authority. Can we say amen? If God's word forbids it, I don't care if everyone else is doing it. I don't know if every one of your Christian friends is doing it. The word of God is the standard. And so he says to them, you're inexcusable according to the truth. You're going to face judgment. Again, God doesn't grade on the curve on how you compare to other men and women. He grades at the cross. We're judged according to his word and according to his son. That's the truth. The word of God is true. And the God of the word, Jesus Christ, is the truth. And he is the word. So guys, that's our plumb line for truth. And that's the standard that we live by. And we don't follow even what other churches may say, or pastors may say, or what people might vote on as being okay. There's churches right now that reject the resurrection. That's not a church. Game over. Amen? If they deny the word of God, if they say, well, it's filled with errors. No, it's not. So anytime we depart from the word of God, we make, every cult does the same thing. They make man more and God less. You're going to be God of your own planet one day if you're a Mormon. Uh, no, you're not. Amen? Jesus Christ is God. He's the standard. We're sinners in desperate need of a savior. When compared to the sinless perfection and holiness of Jesus Christ, in light of his word, we're all guilty. There's no psychologist or expert witness to explain away your guilt by saying you suffer from a disorder. Don't we live in a crazy time right now where no one's guilty of anything? Everyone's a victim. It's not my fault. Everybody, no matter what people have done, it's not their fault. I've been put up for jury duty five or six times. I will never get on a jury because I believe in right and wrong. And they ask you questions. Do you believe in absolute truth? Absolutely. You're excused. Amen. <laughs> they want someone who just believes in the gray and let it float all around. And they don't want anybody who's going to say, well, no, murder's wrong. Yeah, but... But, you know, he wasn't raised very nice and his mom and dad were mean to him. And that's, I'm not downplaying that. That can be rough. But none of that justifies us doing criminal acts. But we live in a world today where everyone's a victim. It's nobody's fault. Nobody wants to take responsibility for anything. Guess when we're all going to take responsibility? Judgment day. And we're either going to be on our face thanking God that we've been forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Or we're going to pay for our sins ourselves. Again, these first three chapters of Romans are heavy because it's all about the doctrine of sin. By the way, why is it so important that we recognize we're sinners? Because if we don't recognize, we're recognize that we're sinners, we'll never see our need for a savior. Amen? We have to first understand, yes, I'm a sinner, so I know that I need a savior. If I think I'm good enough myself, I don't see a need to be forgiven. If I compare myself to Saddam Hussein, I'm okay. If I compare myself to Jesus... I've fallen short of his glory. God knows our hearts, our thoughts, our motives. We all fall short of God's standard. But I'm so thankful that in spite of all that, he loves us anyway. The Bible even says our righteousness is as filthy rags. So the things you're counting on, you know, depending on your background. Well, yeah, I grew up in this place and I did this and I, I got all these things. I'm going to show God when I get to judgment day. Even that is as filthy rags because, guys, we saw the Nessian problem. Verse 3. And do you think this, O oh man... You who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Now imagine the people reading this. You're a religious leader of the day, and you're reading this, and you're seeing, who do you think you are that you 
judge others, you practice the same and somehow you think you're going to escape judgment? For those of us who recognize we're sinners, it grips our hearts and we recognize it's true, Lord, forgive me. If you're self-righteous, you say, who do you think you are talking to me that way? Guys, we're all sinners in desperate need of a savior. And the thing that God hates the most is self-righteous hypocrisy. He flipped over the tables in the temple. He made a whip out of cords. He called them a brood of vipers, which is a bunch of snakes. He said they were whited sepulchers. They looked good on the outside and the inside they were filled with dead men's bones. You know, when the woman caught in adultery comes to the Lord and falls on her face before him, he shows grace. The tax collector shows him grace. The self-righteous hypocrite, it brings out righteous anger in our Savior. May we never be the self-righteous hypocrite. Can we say amen? When we look at other people, we shouldn't look at ourselves as greater. There before the grace of God is every one of us. Amen? I'm just one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. Amen? The Lord showed me where it is. It's not because I'm good. It's because he's great. But let me show you. It's all about Jesus. Let me bring you to him. And so this is a heavy word if you're self-righteous. It's a heavy word if you think you're better than most and a good person. From, but when, there, when you recognize there's none righteous, these words should not be heavy. They should just remind us of who we are. Guys, we can fool men, but we won't fool God. Amen? There are going to be many people stand before the Lord on Judgment Day and say, I, I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I, and he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Because we can fool man, but we can't fool God. Verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, long-suffering, and not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Do you despise the riches of his goodness to neglect or to think against or to take for granted God's goodness? Guys, do we take for granted the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God? May we be reminded every single day how desperately we need him. Amen. That without him... We're lost. Amen? This is why we need to be in the Word of God every day. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by? Word of God. And the truth is, we desire the Word of God more than our necessary food. And, and every time I open up the Word of God, I'm reminded of His grace. And I'm in awe of who He is. And at the same time, the Word of God examines my heart and shows me how, much, how desperately I need Him every single day. Without him, we can do nothing. Without us, he's still God. Can we say amen to that? He's still God. We don't, he doesn't need us. We need him. Now, this was true, especially for the religious leaders. They thought they had a religious heritage, and they did. They're the, God, they're the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the descendants. We're the chosen people. And so the, the mistake that we make, let's put it in today's terms, I've been going to church since the day I was born. I've grown up in, a, in the church. I have a faith in God. If you go into my house, I've got religious stuff on my walls. I've got Bibles in my house. I'm a religious person. And too often we put our faith in religion instead of our relationship with the Lord. And you've heard me say this many times. One more time, won't hurt. The word religion, in original language, is relingara. And I love what it really means. It's relinking sinful man back to holy God. I love that. But what does religion come to mean today? It has come to be a substitute in some cases for Jesus. Well, I'm a part of, you ask somebody and the first thing they'll say is I'm a part of this church. Guys, your faith better not be in Calvary Chapel, Calabasas. Your faith better be in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen? I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of, I'm of the Baptist church, the Catholic church, the Lutheran church, the Calvary Chapel. The, no, we're of Jesus. Amen? And he's exhorting them here that they're taking God's grace and mercy for granted. Man today often mistakes God's patience and mercy for approval for their sin. Uh, you know, the reality is that often we think if, we, if we're continuing in some kind of sinful behavior and lightning hasn't hit us, that God's okay with it. Well, I've been doing this for years. Don't mistake God's patience for God's permission. Amen? I've been living this way for years. Guys, the truth is, the closer we get to the Lord, the more convicted we're going to be. As we said about Paul, he started off by saying, I'm the least of the apostles. And by the time he writes his last letter, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. Because the closer we get to the Lord, the more we recognize how much we fall short and how desperately we need him. Verse 5. 
But in accordance with your hardness and your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Whoa. Now, is that a secret sensitive message? Is it seven steps to financial freedom or three ways to overcome your anger or beaver doesn't live in here anymore, the series or whatever? This is the word of God spoken directly and boldly to very religious people who thought that they were okay with God because of all the rites and rules and rituals that they kept. And here's what he says again, but in accordance with your hardness of your impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself the wrath, wrath and the day of wrath, revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The day of judgment will come in light of all truth. All secrets will be revealed. God's judgment is righteous. And those who come to him with repentant hearts, seeking his love and mercy will be forgiven. But those who come to him with hard hearts and reject his love and forgiveness, bring the wrath of God upon them. Here's the reality. Anybody who endures the righteous judgment of God is going to make a choice to do so. I firmly believe everybody that goes to hell has to run over the cross of Christ to get there. That the Lord draws us unto salvation and we, I'm, I'm not interested. I'm all about me. Don't be telling me. I don't want to surrender my life to anybody. I don't want anybody. I'm not going to, no, I'm not denying myself. I'm, I'm all about myself. And it's all about me and I'm this and I'm wealthy and I'm rich or I'm famous or I'm, and we're full of ourselves and we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. See no need for the Savior. Shake our fists at God, rebel against God, reject God, and then stand before God one day. And my heart is for everybody who's like that, I want to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. How about you? I want to see them come to know the Lord. First three chapters of Romans, heavy stuff. Because it's all pointing to the fact that we're sinners in need of a Savior. A God who did not exercise wrath against injustice and immorality is not a holy God. See, I have people give me a hard time sometimes and say, Pastor Dave, just preach the love of God. Just the love of God. Just the love of God. And absolutely, I, we need to preach the love of God. Amen? Amen? God is love. He's the very definition of it. Amen? But he's also holy. He's also just. Amen? And love does not excuse immorality. It doesn't excuse ungodliness. It doesn't excuse rebellion against God. And so this is a heavy thing because people look and say, well, I just, I don't want to serve a God who judges sin. If he didn't judge sin, he'd be an unholy God. Amen. I didn't get a one amen on that except Jack. <laughs> if we have one sin in heaven, we've got earth part two. Amen. Why did everything crumble on this planet? Because one sin in the garden of Eden. If God allows one sin, first of all, I can have no sin in his presence. You understand that? He's holy, perfect, holy God. That's why Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When the sin of all mankind was placed upon our Savior, it was sepa no, no separation from the Father. They're all one God in three persons. Gives you a headache. I get it. Me too. But the reality is, if he allowed one sin in heaven, we'd have this train wreck all over again. So when someone stands up and says, well, I served in charity and I did this. Here's all the good things I did. I, I love people. I serve people. I, you know, I didn't cut off people in traffic. I was a really nice person. I opened the door for people at the store. I'm a nice person. Won't you let me in? If he lets one of us in, heaven becomes earth part two. So we can't go in our sin. That's why Jesus came. Amen. Not because we're righteous, not because we wear the right clothes, not because we're buttoned up, but because of who we are in Christ. Again, it's essential to the goodness of God that he judges evil. Why did Jesus have to die? Because we're all guilty in light of the truth. And sin requires redemption. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness for sin. So point number one there, we're all guilty in light of the truth. Jesus is the standard. We all fall short. We're guilty in light of the truth. Number two, in light of our actions. Look at verse 6. It says there, in verse 6, who will render to each one according to his deeds. It says in Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. 
I really hate that the term karma has kind of overtaken this. You hear people say it all the time, oh, it's bad karma. I don't believe in karma. But I do believe in righteous judgment. You reap what you sow. Amen? That's a biblical truth. It's not some, oh, I, you know, did, I, I crushed a bug when I was five and it floated out in the sky and now I'm going to get cr-. Nonsense. Okay, it's nonsense. It's not accurate. But we reap what we sow. Can we say amen to that? And if we, you know, sow to the wind, we're going to reap the whirlwind, the Bible says. And he's letting them know that who will render to each according to their deeds. Everyone will face the judgment based upon their deeds. I'm not, I'm not saying this is sound humble. I guarantee you there's a bunch of zeros when you start counting the number of sins I've committed in my life. Can anybody else say amen besides me? I mean, it's, I don't even want to know what the number is. I'm thankful that when the Lord sees me, he sees me through the shed blood of the lamb and he sees me holy and righteous and forgiven, not because I'm good, but because he's good. Amen. And when he sees you, he sees you as saints and holy. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, but this letter is written to all of mankind who thinks that somehow apart from Jesus Christ, they can be made righteous. And he's making it very clear that that's impossible. Look at verse seven, eternal life to those who by Patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. Jesus would say, if you love me, you'll obey me. Are we saved because we obey? What's the answer? No. But should we obey because we're saved? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. We're not sinless, but we should sin less. Amen? And obedience is fruit of salvation, not the source of salvation. Because if we tried to obey and be perfect, first of all, we'd all fall short. And the way, you know, and the reality is that we could try as hard as we want. And what a heavy burden. Can you imagine if you were trying to earn heaven? What a burden that would be, amen? For most people, you know, heaven's a hope so because they're trying to earn it by knocking on doors. They're trying to earn it by doing enough good works to be found favorable in God's sight. Look, I'm holy and you're holy if you're born again, not because again of the good things you've done, but of the greatest act of love in all of human history that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. As he writes this to a religious people, he's letting them know if you're putting your faith in your good works, it's not gonna be good enough. Putting your faith in your good works, you're going to be found wanting. Says there in verse 8, to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth. You know, the world promotes itself. It rebels against God. It disobeys his word. It wants the throne. If we walk in the spirit, we'll deny the self, ourselves. We'll submit to God. We'll obey God's word and we'll give up the throne. Who's on the throne of your life this morning? Is it you or is it the Lord? Have you surrendered your life fully to him? Sin has consequences. Guys, sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Amen? What does that mean? God didn't say, Here, here's some things I don't want you to do. I know they're really fun and they're actually good for you, but I'm just kind of a bummer, God, and I want to make sure that you prove you love me by not having any fun. And there's some churches that are kind of like that. Walk around, oh, everybody looks all bummed out. You know, hit yourself in a, with a board every three steps to prove you love God, you know. And there's this mentality, oh, we'll be full of rules. Oh, heaven at the end, though. Oh, that's not Christianity. He came who might have life and life more abundant. Amen? The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We ought to be the happiest people on the planet. We're going to heaven. But too often there's this mentality of, I've got it, oh, oh, it's just drudgery, and there's this heaviness, and praise God, we don't live under the bondage of that. We're born again, new creations in Christ, we have the promise of eternal life, and we're going to heaven. But we live in a time where people will put their faith in their own good works. I've got, I've got 150,000 followers on Twitter, certainly I'm going to heaven. You know, I, I've got this, I've got that, I've got this award, I've got this. And we love the praise of men. Our heart ought to be that everyone forgets us and they all remember him. Amen. Not about us. It's about him. Amen. Amen? 
Notice what it says there, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jew first and also the Greek. Ooh, you think some blood vessels might have been popping when that was read. Go! The Jew first, are you kidding me? We're Jews, we're already saved. We're, we go to church, I'm already saved. I've been going my whole life. I live in a Christian nation, of course I'm a Christian. And there's this mentality that we think based on who we are and you know, where we live and how we grew up and our heritage that somehow we're forgiven and we're saved. Hell's a real place, did you know it? There's weeping and gnashing of teeth, eternal torment, eternal separation. A lot of pastors will never mention hell. Jesus talked about hell. Amen? I don't delight in hell. I, I, I teach it because I don't want anyone in this room to go there. Amen? You know, one of the many things that's going to be torture about hell is memory of your life on earth. And here's how I know that's true. Luke 16. Lazarus and the rich man. Rich man had everything in the world. Lazarus was a beggar. They both died. Lazarus was a follower of God. He ends up in Abraham's bosom. That's where all believers went until Jesus went to the cross and they rushed into heaven. So there he is. And Lazarus looks across the great gulf and he's in a torment because he was very wealthy, but very self-righteous and didn't see his need for the Lord. And he looks across and he sees the guy who had been at the gates that he walked by every day and said, can you, can he just dip his finger in some water and come put it on my tongue to give me a little bit of relief? The fact that he recognizes Lazarus, the fact that he remembers his time on earth, because then the Lord said, no, he can't come from, from here to you. Separation is sin. Well, can you at least go back and tell my family? Every time I do a funeral, I refer to Luke 16, because everyone needs to know that no matter where people end up, they would come and tell you Jesus is real. Amen? Whether they're in torment, we pray not. But or they're in heaven, they would tell you, guys, get right with God, nothing else matters. Can you imagine spending eternity in hell having been given an opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ over and over and over again? How do you guys know who Raul Reese is? Raul says, you know what, man? It's really heavy, man. Check it out. Check it out. It's heavy, man. Check it out. You're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth all eternity thinking about me. Because I told you you need Jesus. I told you to come forward. You didn't come. You're going to be thinking about me. Don't be thinking about me, man. Raul's a friend of mine. I could pick on him. It's okay. God's using that man mightily. Amen? You know he was waiting with a loaded shotgun to kill his wife and his kids when he got saved? I'll have to show that movie sometime, Fury to Freedom. God can redeem us all. Aren't you glad? Amen. So he tells him, without Christ comes tribulation and anguish. I don't care if, you got to, if you're the most religious person, if you're the Jew of all Jews of the black robe, if you don't have Christ, it's coming. I don't care what your background is. I don't care how many... You know, how many prayers you've prayed. I don't care how many religious things you've done, how many rituals you've kept. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, if you've not confessed your sin, if the Holy Spirit doesn't live within you and you're not born again, you're going to face the righteous judgment of God. I invited someone here this week and I had no idea we we're going to just get beat up like this. This is rough. Verse 10. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also the Greek and don't you love that? He says that judgment comes to everyone, but so too can salvation. Salvation is, uh, judgment will come to all men who reject him. But salvation is available to all men who will, will turn to him. So why did Jesus have to die in light of the truth that Jesus is the standard? We've all fallen short in light of our actions, that we're all sinners in desperate need of a savior. Finally, in light of God's impartial judgment, look at verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. We need to be careful. Sometimes we think that God loves America more than he loves Iraq. Can we say amen to that? We've seen God bless America. How about America bless God? Amen. And I'm thankful for where I live. I love the country I live in. I'm a very patriotic guy. But long before I'm an American, I'm a Christian. And it's not even close. But I'm thankful that we live in a country where we can preach the word of God. We can stand up for the truth. We don't, we don't have to dial it down, at least not yet. Days might be coming. But sometimes we think that he's a God. You know, people can think, well, he's our God. But because there's a lot of Muslims there, he doesn't love those. There's Christians in Iraq. And we need to pray for them. And the people that aren't Christians, we need to pray for them. Amen? There's no Does God love 
everyone that he created. What's the answer? He desires that none should perish, no, not one. And that's why it's nauseating that some will even use Christianity to create bigotry. Amen? They'll carry crosses around while they're cursing other people that aren't like them. That's ungodly. There's no partiality with God. He loves us all. He doesn't care about your background, your heritage, your skin color, how much money's in your bank account, how smart you are. How, you know, it's irrelevant. We're all one in Christ and we've been born again and, and he, there's no partiality and the judgment will be same for everyone and salvation is offered equally to everyone and it's, it's up to each of us. It's offered universally, must be accepted individually. No partiality. Desires that none should perish. If you harden your heart toward God and follow your own path, then God will judge you regardless of your nationality or religious affiliation. The Jews expected special treatment as a chosen people of God, and so do some Americans. Verse 12. For as many as sinned without law, the law will perish without law, and as many as sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Those who have the law will be judged by the law. Do you know the law will save no one? Can we say amen to that? The law saves no one. I went on a sales call some years back. I saw my Christian fish on my car. He was a very devout Jewish man. He said, oh, you're one of those Christians. I said, yeah, I am. He said, well, I'm Jewish. I said, well, so is my savior. And I teach out of a Jewish book every Sunday and Thursday. So praise God for that. And he said, oh, but we're, the, we're God's chosen people. And I have, it's very difficult. I have 252 laws I must keep. I said, how's that working out? How are you doing with that program? Well, not so good. I go, he goes, it's hard. I said, it's not hard. It's impossible. The Bible tells us that the law is a taskmaster or a schoolmaster to lead us to the cross. The law is like a mirror. It shows us that we're sinners, but it cannot save us. Can we say amen to that? When you put a mirror in front of you and you see a big blotch on your face, you don't wipe it with the mirror. And the law can't save us. Now, should we desire to walk in obedience to the word of God? What's the answer? Absolutely. But if we could keep it, if we could do it on our own, Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Amen? So what does the law do? It makes us recognize we're sinners in need of a savior. God never intended for us to take the law and then make that a determination for salvation. It will show that if we're walking in rebellion, if the word of God says this and we do the opposite, it shows rebellion. But too often people think, because here's the reality, none of us have gone a day without sinning. Amen? Well, I don't know. I had a guy tell me one time. I think I, I went about six months one time. <laughs> Pride, sin. You're out. The closer I get to God, the more I realize what a sinner I am. How about you? Oh, Lord, forgive me. I'm convicted daily. And the exhortation here is that the law won't save you. You're going to be judged by the law. And they think they want to be. You know, they're tithing the mint and come in. They're, they're spreading out their thing. And well, I would never do that. I only walk this far on the Sabbath and I only do this. And the reality is that there's no freedom in that. That's bondage. Amen? He who the Son sets free is free indeed. And it's not freedom to sin. It's freedom from sin. You know, we've been saved by grace. That doesn't mean sin's okay. It's not. We should hate it more now than ever. But we don't recognize it as our source of salvation, but we see obedience as fruit of salvation. Amen? And so here's the exhortation to those who are very religious, thinking that the law is going to be their source of salvation. He lets them know, absolutely not. Hearers of the law in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. The law demands perfect obedience. No one is a counter-righteous simply because he knows what the law says. He must obey it 100%. Guess what? Nobody qualifies except for Jesus. Amen? When you look at the law, it reveals your sin. You've heard me say it a thousand times. Sin is, it's an archery term between the bullseye and where you land is the sin distance. We've all missed the mark. Some may be a little closer than others, but we're all miles away. Amen? And so to think 
more highly of yourself than you ought to, to walk around self-righteous and think that you've arrived, that somehow, when, if there is, and then you'll hear people say, well, if there is a God, I'm a good guy, I'll be okay. That's why we cannot skip over the doctrine of sin. This is not, I'm, I'm not hearing as many joyful amens as I usually hear on a Sunday this morning. But if we skip over this, we're preaching an incomplete gospel. Can we say amen to that? Until we recognize we're sinners, we'll see no need for a savior. That's the joyous part about Romans. As you go through, it's like, dude, I'm guilty. We're going to get to the doctrine of salvation and the doctrine of sanctification. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? But this is the part that we need to hear. It brings conviction to all men. Verse 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also being witness between themselves and their thoughts, uh, accusing uh, or else excusing them. You know, everybody has impact of the Holy Spirit in their life, even when they're not saved. Some of you will disagree with me on this, and that's okay. We're still, we're still family. It's all right. I believe the conscience is the Holy Spirit. Because how would we know right or wrong? There's no good thing in me to know right and wrong. Can we say amen to that? My, my, if I go based on my feelings, I'm going to be a wreck. I'm going to weigh 800 pounds and I'm going to be eating everything I want and going everywhere I want to go. My marriage is going to be destroyed. I'm going to be a thief and a crook. And a, amen? But the conscience, the Holy Spirit, people will say, even before they're saved, the Holy Spirit's not in them, but he's with them. And there's a conviction of right and wrong. And that doesn't come from man, because in man dwelleth no good thing. That comes from God. Amen. And so because the Holy Spirit is there, he convicts them. And what he says, even those who didn't know the law are responding in obedience to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's wrong. We shouldn't kill each other. Even though maybe they've never been given the law, thou shalt not murder, they're still accountable to it because the conscience, the Holy Spirit convicts them that harming someone else is wrong. And if they do it, they're guilty, even though they haven't seen the law written down that they shouldn't do it. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what this text is saying. Even those who don't know the law as well as you do, they're right. They understand based on the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The conscience, convicting them that it's wrong or encouraging them when they're doing right. Now, again, that conscience is not enough to get us into heaven because the Bible talks about the Spirit being with us, in us, or upon us. He's with us prior to salvation. Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit in them in the Gospels, and then in Acts, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So, guys, the way we know we're saved, we have a down payment of heaven and the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of us. And now the conviction's heavier. Can we say amen? amen. Think the thought, convicted. Praise God for conviction, aren't you glad? i got to pick it up. So in light of God's impartial judgment, we're all guilty. In light of our actions, we're all guilty. In light of the truth, we're all guilty. By the way, your godly heritage won't save you. It says there, in the day when God, uh, indeed, judge, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, everyone will be judged. Everyone will stand before God. No one will be able to say, I didn't know whether by the truth of the word of God or the conviction of the Holy Spirit, every one of us will be judged according to the gospel, the gospel preached by the apostle Paul, that we're all sinners in desperate need of a savior, that we must be born again, that we must repent. We must be new creations in Christ or we're not going to heaven. That's the gospel. Amen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but? Amen. Amen. Verse 17. I might not finish the chapter. Don't panic. Your godly heritage can't save you. Indeed, you're called a Jew. And rest in the law. And make your boast in God. And you know his will. And approve of things that are excellent. Being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you're, you yourself are a guide. You're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in the darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teachable to uh, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and the truth of the law. So he says, look, you think because you know the law and you live according to it in your mind and you rest in it and you follow it, you're an example that everyone else should follow. You think you're the one that everyone else should be just like you. By the way, we don't want people to be like us. We want them to be like him. Follow Jesus. The only thing I say is follow me as I follow him. That's as close as we can get. Amen? If I don't follow him, don't follow me. And he says, you believe you've arrived. You rely on the law. You boast in God as if 
God only belongs to you. You'll meet people that think the only place the Holy Spirit's moving is wherever they are. You ever met anybody like that? Oh, no, you have to come to my church because we're the only ones. No, you don't understand. And I met people like that. Well, Pastor Dave, that's great what God's doing to you. And it's great to be, but you know, you need to come over here because we're the only ones who really get it. It's just over here. We're the only ones. And there's this mentality that people can have. I'm just as excited when someone gets saved at the Presbyterian Church, Presbyterian Church down the street or Calvary community as when they get saved here. Guys, we're all one church. Amen. Amen? We're building up the kingdom of God, not our fellowship. He says, you know his will through the word. You have knowledge of the things that are more excellent. You've been instructed out of the law. You pride yourself on being moral and spiritual guide to the blind and light to those in darkness. Uh, a corrector of the foolish te- and a teacher of the babes, one having the most accurate knowledge. Again, there's always those. We've all met them. Uh, Joshua and I were talking about a mutual friend that we had that every church he goes to, he just finds out what's wrong with it and writes a letter to let, correct everybody because he's the only one that gets it. Be careful around those people. Amen? I'm not saying that there are times you walk, oh, that's not good, that's error. And that needs to be addressed. But if you can't find any good churches because you're the only one that gets it, maybe you're the problem. Amen? Look at verse 21. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You preach that a man should not steal. Do you steal? You say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You abhor our idols. Do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. Boy, that was a real soft little note there. The word of God does not pull punches. And you'll see the most direct comes when someone is self-righteous and religious and arrogant And that's where the word of God unloads on them because it grieves the heart of God. Let us not be those people. Amen? Maybe not be the people that that people think they only know what we're against and not what we're about. They had head knowledge but no heart change. They knew about God's word, but they didn't know the God of the word. They had taught others, but they did not take the lessons to heart. Pride of race, religion, or knowledge without spiritual transformation. It's tragic. Do as I say, not as I do. It's not surprising to me when you see these self-righteous hypocrites on like Christian television, and I use that term loosely, and you'll see them and and they're living in $15 million mansions and flying private jets and talking and they manipulate people out of money and they're using the word of God to to make themselves famous and, and they're lost. Pray for their salvation. They need to be saved. Amen. Because when we are, think that we've arrived and we're the instructor of everyone else, God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud. Anytime we open up the word of God, we should do it in humility. Anytime we share our faith with anybody, we should do it in humility. Any good in us is only because of him. To him alone be all the glory. Amen? If we walk around in arrogance and self-righteousness, they glorified in their Possession of the law, but dishonored the God who gave it to them by breaking it. Is God honored by your behavior? Or you do you bring dishonor to his name? We all sin. But at the same time, when we sin, if we're quick to be in the heart of confession before God, if we hate our sin, if we desire to walk in the center of his will, if rebellion doesn't describe our life, but it's something that can happen in a moment and we're broken before God when it happens. That's totally different than someone walking around in self-righteous arrogance, acting like they're so perfect and they're the judge of everyone else. And that's who this text is talking about. The combination of high talk and a low walk, is what I call it, caused the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of God. The Gentiles judge the Lord based on the actions of his followers. Guys, if the world judged Jesus on the basis of your actions, what kind of Jesus would they see? The world judged Jesus, the Gentiles did, based on the action they, of, the, of God, and their religion, based on their actions, and saw self-righteous hypocrites and wanted no part of it. My prayer is that we live in such a way that we are humble enough to, to when we blow it, to ask for forgiveness, that we, we show that we're sinners in desperate need of a Savior, and that we point people to Jesus Christ, and that when they see him in our lives, they say, well, that God is real. I can see Jesus in you. 
by the way that you love and you live and you serve. Based on our actions, what would God say, what would people say about the God you serve? What would your coworkers say? What would your children say? Who watch your interactions with your spouse and what would your coworkers say who see you at work? Would they want to know the Jesus that we serve because they see Jesus in us? Not because we're perfect, but because the grace of God's been poured out upon us. Jesus had to die because godly inheritance isn't enough. Amen? Last five verses. Let's look at it. Our religion and rituals won't save you. Look at verse 25. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. If you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if uncircumcised keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Did you just get a headache? I'll explain in a minute. And will not physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you even when you've written code and circumcision or a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Let me use the Christian version or application of circumcision, baptism. Circumcision was a, an outward commitment of an inward covenant. Baptism is the same for us. When we're baptized, we're making a public profession to the world that we've died to ourselves and we're new creations in Christ. We profess that we recognize we're sinners in need of a savior. We repented, we're dead in Christ, and now we're new creations in him. And the application for the Jews was circumcision. The application for us might be bad. Well, yeah, you've been baptized. And yeah, you went down to the beach in Malibu with all the Calvary chapels. And we went down there and you walked into the water and you got baptized. But you know what? If that's all you've done, if it's just an outward ritual you fulfill, but there's been no inward change, you're not really his. Because true baptism or true confession is revealed in our actions, in our hearts, in our attitude, in the change that comes from the inside out. It's not just fulfilling a ritual and then living like the world. It's not just being outwardly circumcised and then rejecting the God of the word and being self-righteous and a hypocrite and arrogant. He's saying, look, what did he say in that last verse? It's not, it's not circumcision of the flesh, it's of the heart. It's in the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. Guys, if we're just looking for men to think we're holy, we can fool people. But God knows the truth as to where we are with him. And guys, it's not about, you know, walking an aisle, praying a prayer, and getting the get out of hell free card in my wallet, and go out and live like the world the rest of my life, and assume I'm saved, because I went forward at camp when I was nine, and I've never talked about the Lord the rest of my life. Let me tell you right now, that's not salvation. There's fruit that will come forth. Amen? Now, the fruit doesn't save you. It's just proof you've been saved. Can we say amen to that? Okay. And so he's saying here that, look, you've kept the law. You've got all the rituals outwardly. You've got all the rules down. You've got, you know, you've got your little book. Here's, how, where, here's the money I gave. Here's the church I went. Here's everything I did. And you, you think you're going to stand before God one day and look, all I did for you. Guys, no, it's not what we do for him. It's what he did for us. And that's what saves us. So in closing, why did Jesus have to die? We're all guilty. Can everybody say amen? We're all guilty. Amen. All right. Light of the truth, compared to Jesus, we fall short. In light of our actions, we're all sinners. In light of God's impartial judgment, again, there's no partiality with God. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Your godly heritage won't save you. Your dad's a pastor. I'm a PK. I'm a preacher's kid, right? My grandkids are preacher's kids because my son-in-law is a pastor. We've got, you know, generations. Of, but you know what? I'm not saved because my dad was a pastor. And none of us are saved because, you know, we had, uh, you know, someone in our family was a nun or a priest or a whatever, missionary, guys, your salvation, or an American, I live in a Christian nation, that doesn't save you. It's got to be a personal relationship with the Lord. And finally, the outward religion and rituals won't save you, again, because just because you've fulfilled all the religious rites doesn't mean you have a relationship with Almighty God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I know this is heavy stuff. I know for a lot of people, this is a, a weighty word this morning. We thank you that it's in the Bible. It's in there for a reason. That's why we teach the whole counsel of God. And Lord, I thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You didn't die for the perfect. You died for the sinful. And we're all thankful because that's all of us. You died because you love us. 
He died because you would, uh, you would rather die than live without us. Because you're a loving God, a merciful God, a gracious God. We're thankful that those of us who have been born again, you see us through the shed blood of your son. You see us as holy and perfect and righteous. You would call us saints, even now. Not because we've earned it, but because of your grace. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. The Bible says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. We've all raised our hands that we're guilty. We all know that we're sinners. But because we're sinners, we all have need for a savior. We can't get to heaven by doing good works. We can't get to heaven by being better than someone else. The only way we can go is if we accept the free gift of salvation that only comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his work of redemption on the cross, and the fact that he proved himself to be God by raising from the dead. So if you confess him with your mouth, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that right now. Confession's a wonderful thing. If we can't confess him in here, we won't live for him out there. If it's your desire to, right now, you've never done this before in your life, the word of God's impacted your heart, the Holy Spirit's drawing you to confess him as your savior. Maybe you've been religious, but you've never made a stand for the Lord. You've never confessed your sin and laid down your life, allowed him to be on the throne of your, of your heart. If that's your desire this morning, which give you an opportunity to do that right now by confessing him, by just raising your hand right where you are and I'll pray for you. Is there anybody at all? Today's a day of salvation. Don't leave here without the Lord. You don't want to be remember, don't remember me in eternity. Lord help. Don't remember this opportunity you had to come to know the Lord. Anybody here at all? Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, that the book of Romans doesn't end here. The doctrine of salvation is coming. The doctrine of sanctification. We can live holy lives set apart unto you. Lord, we love you. We praise you. I pray for everyone here this morning, whatever they may be going through, financially, uh, rebellious children, difficulties in their marriage, health issues, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're a loving and a gracious and a merciful God and you care. We intercede on their behalf now. Touch them, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. let's stand up and, pray and worship him.